Okay, welcome back to Linear Algebra, section 3.2. The first part of it, we're going to take a look at something called the rank of a matrix. Start by recalling that this word rank has already been defined for linear maps. If you take a linear map from V to W, the range of that map is a subspace of W. Every subspace has a dimension, and that dimension is called the rank of the map T. Okay, so I want to define what I mean by the rank of a matrix. In order to do that, I'll just remember that every matrix, say it has M rows and N columns, every matrix defines a linear map left multiplication by that matrix on the coordinate vector spaces, right? So I'm just going to define the rank of the matrix to be the rank of that linear map L sub A. So ranks of maps are defined. So I just define the rank of a matrix to be the rank of the uh, left uh, multiplication operation that the matrix defines. You guys will remember from our previous work that if you take a look at the matrix of that left multiplication operator in the standard basis pairs in both coordinate spaces, that matrix is just A. So if you like, I'm saying that the rank of a matrix is the rank of the linear operator for which that matrix is the matrix in the standard ordered basis pair. Okay, so the first theorem, theorem 3.3, that I want to prove is you can actually use any pair of ordered bases and that the rank of the resulting matrix of T in that ordered pair of bases will, will be the same thing. It's, it's also going to equal the rank of T as a map. Okay, so, so in other words, the bases that you use don't affect the rank is what this theorem is saying. Okay, so how to prove it. Uh, I'm going to let the theorem kind of uh, denote uh, uh, the notation. So I've got a linear map T from V to W. I've picked ordered bases beta and gamma for the domain and codomain respectively. And I'm going to denote by uh, A the matrix of that map T in that ordered basis pair. All right, and then we'll just consider this commutative diagram. We're going to look at the commutative diagram uh, that's shown there. So I've got the map T from V to W on the top, uh, top row of the diagram. The bottom row is the left multiplication by A. And then we've got our uh, isomorphisms that transform V and W into the coordinate vector spaces uh, according to the ordered bases beta and gamma. Okay. So that, commute, that diagram commutes in the sense that this equation holds, that if you do T followed by phi sub gamma, you get the same thing as doing L sub A following uh, phi sub beta. All right. So uh, let's remember that these phi's, they're isomorphisms, right? So isomorphisms don't change dimension. So just looking at this first line here, if you want to take the image of the vector space V under T, and then look at phi sub gamma of that, that's some subspace of FM, it has a dimension. And what is that dimension? Well, it's going to be the same as the dimension of T of V, because a phi sub gamma is an isomorphism. Isomorphisms don't change dimensions of subspaces under their image, right? But T of V is just the range of V, uh, and the dimension of the range of V, or sorry, range of T, is the rank of T by definition. Okay, so that's one comment I want to make. But because this diagram commutes, the space I'm talking about, phi gamma of T of V, I can think of that as apply phi sub beta to V and then apply L sub A of that. I'm going around the diagram the other way, right? Well, phi sub beta is also an isomorphism, so its image is the full coordinate vector space Fn, and L sub A of Fn, well, by definition, that's the range of L sub A. That's the set of output vectors when you apply the linear map L sub A to F of N. All right. So because of that, if you like, uh, I'm just looking here now, uh, phi sub gamma of, of T of V, if I look at its dimension, so that's where I'm starting on this last line, its dimension by, by definition is the rank of L sub A because uh, uh, that subspace is the range of L sub A uh, and the rank of L sub A by definition is the rank of A. All right, so if you put those two things together, what have I done? I've computed this dimension in two different ways. In one way, I get the rank of T, and the other way, I get the rank of this matrix, and that's what the theorem said. Nice. So how to summarize that? What is that theorem saying? It's saying if you want to find the rank of a linear map T, then you can look at its matrix in any uh, ordered basis pair, and uh, find the rank of it, or, or I guess I'm kind of saying that a little bit backwards. If, if, if I 
knew the rank of this matrix, then I can use that information to find the rank of T, okay? So that's kind of the upshot of that theorem 3.3. So that leads to a question, is there some way uh, given a matrix to somehow quote unquote simplify it, do something to it that makes it easy to see what its rank is? All right, so can I simplify the matrix somehow without changing the rank? Because if I could do that, then I could be given a linear operator T, I look at its matrix in some ordered basis pair, I quote unquote simplify that matrix somehow uh, at, without changing the rank, it's, it's a way of I could possibly find the rank of T. It's one of the fundamental questions I want to be able to answer is what's the rank of a, of a linear map. Okay, so uh, with that in mind, let's take a look at the statement of theorem 3.4. So 3.4 is about three matrices. One is arbitrary, arbitrary size, M by N, and then two invertible matrices. So one is square with M rows and columns, one square with N rows and columns, column P and Q. Okay, they're both invertible, it's hypothesis. So what's the theorem saying? It's saying if you left or right multiply by invertible matrices, which side depends on the dimensions? So you just gotta kind of look at it in the statement of the theorem. You don't change the rank. That's what this theorem 3.4 is saying. If I left multiply A by an invertible matrix of the appropriate size, I don't change the rank. If, or sorry, right multiply it. If I left multiply A by an invertible matrix of the appropriate size, I don't change the rank. And then of course, uh, in the proof, that third statement follows from the first two, right? If, if multiplying on the right doesn't change the rank and multiplying on the left doesn't change the rank, then you can certainly multiply on both sides without changing the rank. So I really have to just prove one and two. Three follows easily from it. So how to prove one? Well, let's just look at definitions. Let's look at the range of the linear map uh, L sub AQ given two matrices A and Q. So what is that? L sub AQ we've proven is the composition of L sub A with L sub Q. So it has the same range, right? The range of something is its image. So you just take L sub Q of the domain and then take L sub A of that. But Q is invertible. Q is an invertible matrix. So L sub Q of Fn is Fn. It's a one to one on two map. Its range is everything. And L sub A of Fn by definition is the, is the range of L sub A, right? So since those two subspaces are equal, they have the same dimension. That is the rank of AQ is the rank of A by definition. Okay, so that proves one. How do we prove the second statement? Let me try to leave it visible there while we start. Um, well, uh, uh, if you apply L sub A to Fn, uh, A is possibly not an invertible map, so it's probably not equal to Fm, but you do get some subspace of Fm. Yeah. L sub P is an invertible map. So, so uh, the dimension of its image, the image of that subspace under L sub P is going to be the same as the dim dimension of the subspace, right? Uh, uh, because invertible maps don't change dimension. Okay, but uh, the range of uh, uh, the linear map LPA, that's just take LA of FN and then apply LP to it. And the range of the linear map A is just apply LA to F of N. Okay, so if you put all that together, then you exactly get that the dimensions of those spaces are equal. So the, the rank of PA is gonna be equal to the rank of A. So basically in both parts of the proof, it boils down to applying an invertible map doesn't change the dimension of the space. Uh, in part one, the invertible map went first. In part two, the invertible map goes second, but in both cases, they don't, they don't change the dimension of the space. Good, all right. So an important corollary of that, this is kind of a, a, our main, one of the main results of the section. An important corollary of it is that if you apply elementary row or column operations to a matrix, you don't change its rank. So, so taking a matrix and performing any elementary row operation or any elementary column operation to it doesn't change the rank of that matrix, okay? That's an important fact. Why is that true? Well, last time in, in, in section 3.1, we proved that you can perform elementary row and column operations by multiplying on the left or the right by suitable invertible matrices, right? So we just proved that when you multiply on the left or the right by an invertible matrix, you don't change the rank. Nice. Here's another useful idea. <clears throat> 
another useful idea in this business is that if you start with a matrix A, it has M rows and N columns. I'm going to stop saying that and just let the notation say it because my tongue is tripping on it. So if you take a matrix A, then its rank is the maximum number of linearly independent columns. Okay, so this is going to be sort of a way that we're going to look for the rank is, is we'll look for the maximum number of linearly independent columns. So, so let's see why, why this is true. Um, remember that the definition of the rank of a matrix is the rank of the linear operator that's multiplication by that matrix, which is the dimension of that linear oper's range, right? So if we take the standard basis, sigma sub n is the standard ordered basis in Fn, then the range of the left multiplication operator, well, the range of any linear map is the span of you apply that linear map to each one of the basis vectors. But applying L sub A is left multiplying by A. And you guys proved uh, in a homework problem that when you left multiply uh, the matrix A by a standard basis vector, you end up getting the corresponding column of the matrix A. So C1 is the first column of A, C2 is the second column of A, and so on. So the rank of A, it's the dimension of that range. It's the dimension of the span of those column vectors, C1 to Cn. Okay, well, the dimension of that span is certainly going to be the maximum number of linearly independent column vectors in the matrix A. Nice. Okay, so now the question becomes like, well, given a matrix, how do we determine how many linearly independent columns it has? That's that's sort of a new way to find the rank. <clears throat> so that's our question. Given some matrix A, how can I determine how many linearly independent columns A has? So well, this question, we're going to kind of give a very technical answer to it. It's theorem 3.6. I'm going to omit the proof of this theorem from this lecture. This lecture is already going to be kind of long. The proof of this theorem is something that I want you to read. It's a proof by induction. Uh, and then we can just talk about it in an office hour about the, uh, the details of the proof. But here I'm just going to state what it means and then we'll go on and, and use it. There's some important consequences of this theorem. So what does the theorem say? If you take a matrix uh, and let's suppose that it has rank R, I'll just give, its, uh, give a name for its rank. And the theorem says, well, a couple of things. That first of all, that R can never exceed the number of rows or the number of columns. Uh, that, it it kind of makes sense. The, the R can't exceed the number of uh, rows uh, makes sense because if you think about what the rank of this matrix is, well, it's the dimension of the range uh, uh, of the operator L sub A. That's a subspace of FM. And certainly no subspace of FM has dimension more than M. So, so that one is no problem, but, but it's also true that this rank cannot exceed N, it cannot exceed the number of columns, okay? And then uh, uh, the kind of main part of the theorem, which gets proved by induction on the number of rows, is that you can use a finite number of row and column operations, right? So those elementary row and column operations, uh, using both kinds, you can transform A into a matrix of a very special form, D is what its name, it's for diagonal. And you basically get an R by R block uh, of identity matrix up in the upper left-hand corner. So this thing has R rows and R columns. And then you get uh, a bunch of zero matrices in the other blocks, all right? You can kind of look at this picture, stop the video for a second and think about how many blocks there are. But if the matrix A had N columns total, then there must be n minus r columns left over here. Uh, we already said there's r rows right there. It had m rows total, so there must be m minus r rows down there. So you can see the various sizes, like this block of zeros, the o sub 3 down there. It must be m minus r by n minus r and so on. All right. So o sub i, i is 1, 2, or 3, is just a matrix of zeros. So this thing is sometimes called a block form matrix. So the theorem is saying that with a finite number of row and column operations, you probably need to use both. You can reduce the matrix A into this form. OK, 
Okay, the proof, which I'm not going to include here in this video lecture, uh, is by induction on M, and I encourage you to try to read it and digest it. Get out a blank piece of paper and a pencil and just line by line work your way through that proof and come talk to me about the uh, details of it. Instead of proving it here, I want to look at an example, and I'm going to use one of the author's examples. So let's take this matrix A. Uh, it's written there. It's got four rows and five columns. Yeah. So our numbers M uh, is four and N is five. So the theorem says that the rank of that matrix is no more than four. It has to be less than or equal to both of those numbers. So it has to be less than or equal to the minimum. And then the author is gonna sort of do some row and column operations. So, so I took this example straight from your book. You can look at it there too, but I want to, as we're talking about it, say what, what is these, these numbers that he's writing there? They, they, they don't represent the kind of row operation or column operation. They represent how many the author is doing. So let's just kind of look at a couple of these things. We won't, we won't slow this video down so much to look at all of them, but let's, let's try to write on here, say from uh, A, this is just the matrix A written again. Uh, what, what have they done? They've done one operation. Can you stop the video and kind of see what it is? I'm just going to say it right now, but to me, it looks like they swapped the first two rows. Yeah, so it's a row operation. And if we use our notation we were talking about, it looks like row one got interchanged with row two. That's what that operation is there. All right, what about this second one? Again, the author's one means that a single row or column operation was done. Uh, uh, what was done? I think that row one was replaced with one quarter row one. So I think that was a row operation. And just kind of squeeze those in there. All right, in the next step, uh, uh, what does this two mean? It means that the author has done two operations. Can we see what they are? Um, it looks to me like uh, some zeros appeared in this first column. So, so you can stop the video and verify this, but I think those two operations are, I think that row three got replaced with row three minus eight times row one. That was one thing that happened. And I think that row four got replaced with row four uh, minus six times row one. That's what those two operations were, okay? Uh, and so on, let's, let's talk about one more. The author did three things. This actually took me a while to puzzle this out because I'm sort of not used to column operations. But yeah, I think that the author did three column operations. I think that column one, let me write just one of them. Column one was replaced, uh, so excuse me, column two was replaced with column two minus column one. Uh, and likewise for column three and uh, uh, column four was replaced with uh, column four minus two times column one and so on. Okay, so so this is, it's getting boring to listen to this, but I hope you'll kind of stop or look in your book and try to explain to yourself, write down, what is the one operation done here? Was it rows or columns? What are the two there? What are the three there? What are the one there? You can see it's very computationally intensive. Right, if we're just adding up the number of operations so far, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen operations. We're still not done. Fifteen, sixteen operations later. Some are rows, some are columns, but this is the punchline that we get end up getting a matrix <clears throat> of that form. All right. We were doing row and column operations, so we never change the rank. We never change the rank. So, so this matrix, the theorem says that when you end up with this identity matrix in the corner, here it's I3, that three is the rank of A. It's part of what, what the, the theorem proves in, in theorem 3.6, we didn't look at the proof. So, so this matrix A that we started with has rank three. Right, because the matrix D clearly has rank three. So, so does the matrix A because we never change the rank in doing those however many we said 16 row and column operations. 
uh, uh, you can see, uh, uh, like the author said, we get this three by three identity block, R by R in general, and then some zero matrices. Uh, and those zero matrices aren't necessarily going to be square. The sizes of those blocks, well, it depends on <clears throat> M and N and R. All right, but that's theorem 3.6 says that one could always do this. One could always take an arbitrary matrix A, if I zoom out a little bit so we can see all of this business at once, I can always take an arbitrary matrix A and then perform a possibly large number of row and column operations and put it in the form of a matrix D like that, a diagonal matrix D. Well, it's, it's, it's not strictly diagonal because it's not a square matrix, but it has this diagonal uh, upper corner. Okay, never changing the rank. Cool. So let's look at some consequences of this. Let's look at some consequences of this theorem. So the first one is if you give me a matrix A and it has rank R, then there are invertible matrices. One of them is M by N and the other one is um, uh, N by N. Let's call them P and Q respectively, such that the uh, matrix product PAQ is equal to this matrix D. Okay, that's the same kind of form as the matrix from the, from the proof or from the example. So, so why, why is this? I didn't write the proof out. Well, we just said that in, in that theorem, you can transform A by a sequence of elementary row and column operations, right? We know that row and column operations can be uh, obtained, this is theorem 3.1, by left or right multiplying by elementary matrices, which are invertible. So, so if you wanted to kind of put in some details of the proof here, this matrix P, it's some product of elementary matrices. How many of them? It depends on how many row operations, but each one of those is invertible and the product of invertible matrices is invertible. Q is also a product of elementary matrices. How many of them there are depends on uh, how many column operations we've done uh, and the product of invertible matrices is invertible. So, so, so this first corollary is really just sort of a reformulation of the fact that we do that with a finite number of row and column operations. Okay, so that's one corollary. Second corollary I took from the book because it's uh, a lot to write out. Uh, so again, if you take an N, M by N matrix, uh, there's three parts of this, this second corollary. First part is that the rank of the transpose of that matrix and the rank of the matrix are the same, okay? Uh, as a consequence of that, the rank of any matrix is the maximum number of linearly independent rows. We already proved it was the maximum number of linearly independent columns, but we can also use rows, okay? So, so it's the dimension of the subspace generated by its rows is another way to say that. Uh, and then if you looked at those row and column spaces, the dimensions uh, uh, that the spaces generated by the rows or column of a matrix, they're going to generate subspaces of equal dimension. And in particular, that dimension is the rank. Okay, so that's what the second corollary says. Let's look at, at, at some proofs of these statements, or at least outlines of the proofs. So for the first part, uh, uh, that the transpose has the same rank as the matrix, but well, we just proved above that uh, you can multiply A on the left and right by invertible matrices of the appropriate size to get that matrix D, right? So if you take the transpose of both sides of that and remember that the transpose of a product is the product of the transposes in the other order, we get that second equation, QT times AT times PT is DT, all right? The transpose of an invertible matrix is also invertible. That's from our work back in chapter two. So uh, the rank of this matrix A transpose, it's the same as the rank of the matrix D transpose because multiplying by invertible matrices doesn't change the rank, okay? So if I give a name for the rank of A, let's call it R, then by uh, the first corollary, what is R? R is the size of that identity block that we get in the matrix D, right? So I'll leave you to think about the details here, but when you transpose that matrix D, you also get an R by R identity up in the upper corner. So the rank of the matrix D transpose is also R, right? So, so that, why, well, that, that follows from uh, uh, the th theorem 3.5. 
uh, uh, theorem 3.5 uh, says that the um, number of linearly independent columns is the rank of the matrix. And that number for a matrix like D transpose is obviously R. So then you just put all that together. We said the rank of A transpose is the rank of D transpose, but that's R, but that's the rank of A. Cool. So stop the video and kind of hash through that at your own speed. Uh, uh, what about the second part? Uh, uh, in part B, the maximum number of linearly independent rows of a matrix A is the maximum number of linearly independent columns of A transpose, right? Uh, uh, by theorem 3.5, that maximum number is the rank of A transpose, but we just proved that's the rank of A. Good. So it's just some transposing. Uh, for the third part, that the row space and the column space, that is the dimensions spanned by the rows and the columns of the matrix, well, well they, they both have dimension rank of A by part B of this theorem. Okay, so, so, so in particular, they're equal to each other. Nice. One more corollary of theorem 3.6. This one is going to be important for some of our work on Friday. Every invertible matrix can be written as a product of elementary matrices. This is kind of a, a fundamental factorization problem. If you give me an, an invertible matrix, I can write it as a finite product of matrices that are elementary in the sense of uh, section 3.1. So why is that true? Well, if you give me a matrix that's invertible, first of all, it's square, right? Uh, if you're a non-square matrix, invertibility doesn't even make sense. And if it's invertible, then it's one-to-one -one and onto. If it's onto, the dimension of its range is, is as big as it can be. Its rank is N, it's the size of the matrix, all right? So if we apply theorem 3.6, if we go through that procedure, the matrix D, it actually has to end up being the identity matrix because the rank of the matrix A is the size of that identity block that we're gonna get, okay? So then uh, uh, using the previous corollary, that means that we can find invertible matrices P and Q that we can left and right multiply A by respectively to get the identity matrix, to get that matrix D, but D is the identity matrix. P and Q are invertible, okay? Now we just left multiply by P inverse and right multiply by Q inverse, and we have the A is the product of those things. But remember, P and Q themselves were inverted, were, were elementary matrices. P and Q themselves were products of elementary matrices. The inverse of an elementary matrix is, is elementary. So A here is written as a product of elementary matrices. Okay, P inverse times Q inverse. I'm not saying P and Q are elementary, they're products of elementary matrices. Cool. Okay, so one last result in this section, I'm not gonna prove it, I'm gonna leave the proof to you, but it's just, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing to have in mind uh, and, and you can check it out. It's just talking about how rank behaves under composition. We've already kind of done a special case of this when you're composing with an invertible map, the rank doesn't change. In general, the rank never gets bigger, all right? So if we just pick this apart a little bit, if you take two linear maps, one from V to W and one from W to Z, so you could compose them in that order, T followed by U. And you could ask the question, well, what's the rank of that composition? And, and the theorem is saying it's never more than the rank of U. It's never more than the rank of U, and moreover, it's never more than the rank of T. Parts B and C are just the matrix versions of that. You take two matrices A and B, the rank of the product never exceeds the rank of either individual factor. So, so, so when you compose linear maps, or if you like, when you multiply matrices, you, can, you can't make the rank get bigger. It can only get smaller. Uh, if, if any of the maps T or U are invertible, then you don't change the rank at all. Okay.